Hello, welcome back. I have a question for you. Why is it that when we look at the moon in the sky, we always see the same face of the moon facing us all the time? I mean, after all, if the moon is going around the earth, then uh, shouldn't we see different sides of the moon? Like, why is it that we only see the same face of the moon? In fact, if you think about it, all throughout recorded history, every person you ever read about, you know, Alexander the Great, Cleopatra, anybody, right? Thousands of years ago, when they looked up at the moon, they saw exactly the same face of the moon that you see. Exactly the same thing. So you're looking at the same thing, right? Um, in fact, we didn't actually get any pictures of the other side of the moon until we started space travel with spacecraft and space probes. The astronauts get to orbit the moon and see the backside of the moon and space probes as well. But we don't. Why? Isn't that weird? Isn't that a weird coincidence? That is what we're going to explore today. Now, the phenomena of the moon, when, it, uh, when we only see one face of it like that, we call it tidal locking or tidal, a tidally locking situation, right? In fact, we see it with our moon, but we see it with other moons in the solar system as well. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick little list, uh, but we you know, just know that it, this, this list is not a complete list. Jupiter's moon Io, uh, Jupiter's moon Europa, Jupiter's moon Ganymede, Mars has two moons, Phobos, Deimos, Saturn, uh, lots of moons are tidally locked, Mimas and uh, Enceladus, Uranus has a moon called Miranda, Neptune has a moon called Triton, Pluto has a moon called Charon. In fact, Charon is tidally locked to Pluto, but Pluto is so small, it's tidally locked to Charon as well, so they orbit each other and sort of face each other all the time, right? And lots of planets that we've discovered outside of our solar system, extrasolar planets, we know or highly suspect that they're tidally locked as well. So when you first learn about tidal locking with the face of the moon always being the same, it seems like it must be some crazy cosmic coincidence. But actually, most moons, a lot of moons, uh, are tidally locked. So there must be some physical situation that makes it common. That is what we're going to talk about right here. So in order to get there, we have to talk about the tides and the, and the interaction between the moon and the Earth. So we're going to come back to this picture in a second. But let's come over here and, and explain what we're talking about. And in fact, I could open this with another question for you. Does the moon rotate as it orbits the Earth? And uh, honestly, uh, only a small percentage of people know the answer to that question if you haven't thought about it very much. The answer is yes, the moon rotates on its axis just as the Earth rotates on its axis. It, uh, uh, it, it does, and that is actually the reason why we only see one side of the moon. But it isn't quite obvious, so let's talk about it uh, right here. Let's say that the moon did not rotate on its axis. So what I'm going to do, and by the way, I'm going to move this moon around the Earth, but just know this is a picture of the moon. This is the, this is the face that we see. So really, if I were doing this experiment, it would be like, it would be orbiting like this, okay? Because we only see this side of the moon, but I have to use some picture. So just know that this is the face that we see, and so it's a little bit uh, not exactly what I'm trying to, to illustrate here. But what I'll do is I'll put this big crater down to the bottom, and I'm going to draw a line from the center of this thing all the way to the edge so we can keep track of it. I'll, put, I'll even put a little arrow here so we can kind of keep track of one little position. If the moon did not rotate on its axis, if it did not rotate on its axis, then as the moon goes around the planet, it would maintain the same orientation. Notice I'm not rotating anything. And then the people that are living over here would see a different face of the moon. And if I'm not rotating on its axis, then the people over here would see the backside of the moon or the so-called dark side of the moon. It's not really dark, by the way. It sees sunlight um, uh, periodically, just, just as you might expect, but we used to call it the dark side of the moon. And then we get down here, these people would see a different side of the moon. And then when we get back to where we started, uh, we would see the, the same face again. Clearly, that is not what happens. All people on planet Earth see the same phase of the moon. Or it's not the same phase, the same side, the same face of the moon is what I'm trying to say. So it turns out that the Earth is rotating like this. This is true. Um, and in fact, I'll, uh, I guess I'll write that down. I may uh, erase it. But the Earth is rotating in this direction. Um, uh, I'll put rotation. Now, again, you have to use your imagination because I had to pick a picture. When I say it's rotating this direction, that's not really true. This is the North Pole and this is the South Pole. So actually, 
I'll come back to this picture real quick. This is the picture of the Earth here. I'll talk about all these tides in a minute. This is the Earth. This is the North Pole. So looking down from the North Pole, the Earth is rotating this direction, right? And uh, looking down on the Moon's North Pole, it's rotating this direction. Now, this is obviously not the North Pole of the Earth. So when I draw a rotating arrow, it doesn't rotate like this. But I, I don't have a, a nice graphic looking down on the surface of the Earth. So you have to use your imagination. But anyway, the Earth is rotating on its axis. It's really rotating from the North Pole like this or around its axis. And um, the moon is rotating also in the, I'm right in the same direction, even though the pictures I'm using here are not exact. So the moon is rotating um, as well. But the moon is traveling on an orbit, I'll go ahead and put it like this, an orbit around the Earth, right? And so the moon is rotating like this, right? So if the moon rotates really, really, really fast, like really, really, really fast as it goes around the planet, then we're still gonna see the entire moon. You see, because if it's rotating so fast as it goes around, you see how it's making all these revolutions? Eventually, somebody on the Earth is going to see the backside of the moon if it rotates really, really fast. Let me go back to my little starting point right here. If the moon, however, rotates very slow, very slow, then over time, we're still going to see all sides of the planet. I'm rotating it. I'm rotating it, but very, very, very slow. So you see what's going on? We've... we've uh, if we rotate it really, 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 really slow, eventually you can see the whole, uh, the whole circumference of the whole uh, uh, side, the whole, both faces, both sides of the moon there as well. There is a point where we call it tidal locking, where the moon rotates at exactly the same um, uh, rate as the uh, as the orbital period of the moon that goes of the moon that goes around the Earth. In other words, it rotates in such a way that one side of the moon, look at this arrow, is facing the Earth at all times. Now the people up here only see the same face, right? And I'm still rotating it, but I rotate it in such a way that this arrow right here is still facing the Earth. I'm rotating the moon. I'm physically turning it like this, right? in such a way that this arrow always faces the Earth, like this. Now, the first time you learn about this, it seems like, wow, what a coincidence, wow, that it rotates at exactly the right rotational speed so that the moon's orbit, which takes 27 days around the Earth, takes 27 days for the moon to go all the way around the planet Earth, it rotates at such an angular rate so that that uh, one side always faces the Earth. That is so weird. It's such a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. It's because of physics. It's because of the forces acting on the uh, on the moon. And of course, now we know, I've given you lots of other examples, lots of moons behave this way, right? And give you a whole bunch of examples. So the question is, why does this happen? Okay, so we need to take a little bit of a detour, right? I've already done a, a video, a lesson in the past on the tides of the Earth. I'm gonna give you a real quick synopsis of that because it sort of, uh, the similarities here that we need to talk about. But the answer to this question is actually very easy to answer once we do a little background talking. So let's go back over here. This is a picture I drew for the previous lesson. Here we have the moon, which is rotating. And here we have the Earth looking down from the North Pole, which is rotating. That's what this means. Now the moon is exerting a gravitational force on the oceans. And uh, so the, the oceans bulge out like this on one side facing the moon and bulge out on the opposite side of the Earth. Now I spent a lot of time in a previous lesson explaining why we have two bulges, one on the back and one on the front. And uh, I encourage you to watch that other video. I don't want to go through the whole thing again. But the reason is because of the, the inverse square law of gravity. The Earth, uh, the moon is attracting with a stronger force over here and a weaker force over here. And when you go through the whole math and explanations, you can convince yourself that you should get two tidal bulges on the Earth. And that's exactly what we get. And we can measure this with GPS, so we know this is uh, the case. Now, the bulging of the oceans is not exactly lined up with the moon. Notice it's kind of slanted, and that's because the, er the oceans are bulging and the Earth is spinning very fast, so it's sort of dragging the oceans kind of in the direction of rotation, and so it's sort of cocked up like this at an angle relative to exactly where the moon actually is. So the Earth's oceans are bulging out. They're slightly slanted with respect to the direct line to the moon like this. And then as the Earth rotates and happy little Jason travels all the way around the planet, you see the moon takes 27 days to go around the Earth, but the Earth only takes one day to turn in a circle. Every six hours I go from a high tide where the oceans are bulging to a low tide where they're not bulging as much. And six more hours I get here and six more hours I get here. So I have the high tide, the low tide, the high tide, 
the low tide. That's the condensed version of the whole lesson I did on the tide. So I encourage you to go watch that for more detail. Now, why am I bringing it up? Because just like the moon here is attracting the earth and the gravitational influence tends to stretch out the earth, so to speak, the oceans kind of get stretched out into an, uh, into an uh, ellipse sort of shape. What ends up happening is the reverse. Uh, the the uh, moon, of course, is attracting the uh, earth and causing that to happen to the ocean. Let me erase this right here. So just as the earth is attracted, uh, attracting the moon and stretching it out into sort of like an oblong shape, the oceans are coming out like this, the earth is in turn attracting the moon. But the moon doesn't have any oceans. It doesn't have a fluid that can nice and freely just take the shape of the container, so to speak, and just get easily stretched out uh, here. So what ends up happening, actually, I'll do an exaggerated view, is the moon gets stretched out like this. Now, the moon obviously doesn't look like a, like a pancake like this. So it's it's not that pronounced. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a little area right here, just like we had for the other one. So what I've drawn is a, an exaggerated view. The moon gets stretched into kind of an oblate shape like that, to a, sort of an egg shape. And it's happening for the same reason that it's happening on Earth, because the gravity of the Earth is acting on the moon, and the near side has more force, and the far side has less force, and just like it happens with the oceans, it happens with the moon. But of course, the flexing of the moon, um, the flexing of the moon is uh, under more stress, for lack of a, a better word, because the oceans can freely move. But when the moon flexes, then there's a lot of internal stresses and strains, and it can't respond. The crust of the moon cannot respond and flex quite as fast as an ocean and a water can, right? But it does happen, and we can measure this with instruments uh, that we have on the moon and with uh, lasers and other things that we can do to look at the moon, okay? So the question is, how does this oblong shape lead to the idea that the same side of the moon is always facing the Earth? Look at the arrow, always facing the Earth. Okay, so we have to take two situations. A long time ago, we know from astronomy that the moon was actually rotating on its axis faster than it is today, faster than it is today. So if the moon is orbiting like this now, notice the same face uh, uh, always pointed toward the Earth, in the past, the moon was rotating much, much, much faster, right? Right, now what's going on is that as soon, in the past, in the distant past, um, as the moon rotates faster, then this egg shape gets out of alignment with the Earth. You see like this, it's not pointed like this. If it was traveling faster, it may even get over here. Now, as soon as it starts to get out of alignment, the crust of the moon, you gotta imagine the moon like Play-Doh, right? As soon as it gets out of alignment, the gravity is pulling it and squeezing it and trying to make it point like this again. But the moon's crust is not like the, not like the oceans of the Earth, it can't respond instantly. It's a gigantic solid substance. So it can move, but just think of an earthquake. It's not something that happens like instantaneously, right? So as it, if it's rotating faster and it's like this and it's trying to get squeezed back into this position, but before it can fully form in the new position, what ends up happening is the Earth attracts this bulge a little bit more strongly and tends to pull it back into position. So if the, let me say that one more time, if the moon's rotating faster, then the earth ends up, because this is now a very large piece a little closer to the earth, it tends to slow the rotation down and get it to point backward toward the earth. If it goes faster again, then the earth is going to attract it and try to get it as close as possible. If it keeps going faster like this, then it keeps, uh, it keeps generating a force, a torque really, on the moon that keeps pulling it back like this. And over a very long period of time, the moon's orbital rotation slowed down. So it was rotating much, much faster in the past, but it began to slow down. Why? Because the Earth pulls the moon into an egg shape, and it, as it was rotating faster, there's a force on this side tending to slow it down. Now, if you go the other way, what if the moon was orbiting really, really, really slowly in the past? We, we know that it wasn't orbiting slowly in the past, but let's say that it was orbiting very, very slowly in the past. So instead of orbiting faster, let's make it go over here and just orbit very slow, like that. Right? So let's, let's actually, let's bring it here. Let's say it gets all the way here, but just a little bit of a rotation, not very much at all, like that. What's gonna happen? The Earth sees this very large egg-shaped uh, body over here, and it's gonna tend to, to gravitationally pull on this and try to make it point down. It's gonna generate a torque to speed the moon up. And so as we get over here, if it's just a little bit rotation, very slow rotation, then the Earth is gonna attempt to try to give a torque 
and rotate it faster to line up. So we've gone through both situations. Since we know the, uh, the uh, moon is egg-shaped because of the gravitational influence of the Earth, if it's rotating really, really, really fast, the Earth is gonna try to pull it and slow it down. So notice I'm rotating it this way, but the force of gravity is gonna go in the other way to pull it. You see how I'm rotating my hand back and forth, back and forth, because as the moon, if it were going very fast around the Earth, the gravitational force would tend to slow the rotation of the moon. Slow the rotation of the moon. Slow the rotation from the moon. And even though we know that this did not happen, if the moon, let's say we're at this magic spot now, let's say the moon's rotation slows further from here. So let's say that we get all the way around here with just a little bit of rotation like this. Then the Earth is gonna attract this and try to generate a torque to speed up the rotation. So no matter what happens, there will always be a force or a torque acting on the moon to either speed up the rotation or slow down the rotation. So no matter which way you go, it always wants to settle into a state where the same face of the moon is always facing the Earth. And that's because if the moon were to ever rotate any faster, there'll be a force to try to slow the rotation down. If the moon ever slowed down too much, so that it just didn't rotate very much, there would be a force to speed up the rotation. So no matter what happens, it's going to settle into a state where the same face of the moon will face the Earth. And that's why we see the same face of the moon all the time. And that's why this concept of tidally locking is very common in the solar system and in the universe. All these moons I told you, they're tidally locked. We know that they're tidally locked. There's a whole dozen or two dozen additional moons that in our solar system that we suspect are tidally locked, but we just haven't sent a probe there to know for sure. So they probably are. And it turns out that the more massive the moon and the closer it is the, the moon to the body or the planet to the sun, um, the the more likely the tidally locking or the faster it will happen, the more likely it will be to happen. So when we look at extrasolar planets, planets that are far away in other star systems, and we can indirectly measure these, I'll do a whole lesson on that one day, we are highly suspect that they're tidally locked as well because a lot of the planets we can detect around other star systems are gigantic planets more massive than Jupiter, and they're often orbiting closer to their sun than than, uh, than our Jupiter is orbiting uh, there. So a very massive planet orbiting close to a, to a star is going to end up being tidally locked. Because the closer the object is to the star or the planet, the more stretched out it gets. And so then this, this force on it is gonna be more pronounced. If you have a planet orbiting very far away and it's also a really, really tiny planet, then the forces are not gonna be that great and it may not, it may take so long to become tidally locked or never become tidally locked that we never see it. But the ones that we see are often larger planets or moons near their planets or stars and orbiting very, very rapidly. And our moon is actually a very large moon compared to the Earth. And so it's not too far away, and that's why it's tidally locked. So it's not a coincidence. It's just because of the forces of gravity acting on it. And so I hope this has um, made it uh, easier to understand. Personally, when I look at the moon, of course, I find it beautiful, and I look at it through a telescope. I highly encourage you to do that. It's really amazing just to look at it through a small telescope. But what I like to think of is that even like Napoleon and just whoever, Gandhi, you know, whoever you want to think of, whatever historical figure you want to think of, or even uh, people from prehistory before we even had written language. You know, those children that grew up looked up and they were wondering about the moon, just like we all wonder about the moon when we see it in the night sky. But they were looking at the same moon I am because this tidally locking, it happened many years ago, millions of years ago. And so we've all, as humankind, and even, even as just animals in prehistory, have been looking at the same exact face of the moon that we see today. So I find it like a common thread that, that weaves through history, that even like soldiers on the battlefield, people in love, you know, people going through whatever they were going through in their life, when they walk outside and they look at the moon, they were looking at exactly the same face of the moon, pretty much looking identical as it does to me today. I find that interesting. I hope you've enjoyed this. I encourage you to go on, maybe watch it a few times, and then follow me on to the next lesson. We'll continue to learn amazing things about our universe.